Hello, I'm Shelley Sinland. December 14th, 2012 is a day most of us will never forget but find it painful to remember. It was one of the darkest days in our state's history, a time when, as Governor Dan Malloy said, evil came to our state. 20 young children and six adults were brutally gunned down at the Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown. It was a day that shook many of us to the core, made us question our belief in humanity and the world. How and why could something like this happen? The incident was the deadliest mass shooting at a school in U.S. history and the third deadliest mass shooting by a single person in the United States. Even though it has been almost four years since that horrific day, family members and first responders continue the slow healing process. Today, we want to take a look at another angle of that tragic day. Those who covered the story, journalists reporting from the scene and the impact it had on them. Joining us now here in studio is Darren Sweeney. Darren is an assistant professor in the Department of Journalism at Central Connecticut State University and is also a meteorologist and reporter at the local NBC affiliate located right here in West Hartford. Darren has been working on a project at CCSU that involves the Sandy Hook tragedy and trauma journalism. Darren is here now to tell us a little bit more about this project. I have to say, as a former journalist myself, I worked at Fox 61 for 15 years. Mm -hmm. This was something that isn't really talked about and covered that much. So it's fascinating and, and it's, you know, I commend you for bringing this up. Well, thank you, Shelley, and, and thank you for being here. And you're one of the, you're, you're perfect to be here because you've covered some horrific things in right. the past. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But uh, one of the things that I was studying at Central Connecticut State University when I started there as an assistant professor is social media and how it's changing the way in the journalism landscape. And it certainly is changing the journalism landscape. We're seeing things much faster now. We're seeing them unedited. We're seeing things just raw now. And when you have tragedies and stories like the Sandy Hook tragedy, I sat back and started to think as, as an academic, hey, this has got to have some lasting impacts on, on journalists. Um, you know, there's a bunch of different things that we can talk about, but there's the inaccuracies that come from social media. There's a lot of um, problems with social media today, but we only have 30 minutes. And the one thing I noticed is that social media is helping uh, the public and journalists to get stories out much faster. And with that, we're seeing things that we hadn't seen before. Uh, we've seen horrible stories lately. We've seen the, the Orlando nightclub shooting, the Aurora, Colorado shooting. The list goes on. And having worked through the Sandy Hook tragedy, I saw the impact on my colleagues, and I saw how the grief counselors were brought in mm -hmm. to deal with folks that had a hard time even coming to work and saying, I can't do this, especially the folks that had uh, children. The images, the sound bites we were airing, and just the overall uh, notion of what had happened started to get me thinking, journalists are responders to mm -hmm. horrific situations. You have the victims, of course. You've got the first responders. And then you've got journalists that are showing up very uh, soon after the first responders. So that has an effect on them, obviously. So I wanted you to take a look at this uh, quick documentary that I did uh, called The Sandy Hook Tragedy, Journalists Covering and Coping with Trauma. And I do want to warn you that some of the images you may find a little hard to watch. John 911, what's the location of the emergency? Sandy Hook School. I think there's somebody shooting in here. Sandy Hook School. Okay, what makes you think that? Because somebody's got a gun. I saw a glimpse of somebody. They're running down the hallway. Okay. Well, they're still running. They're still shooting. Right. Sandy Hook School, please. We got word in the newsroom of some sort of police activity at a school, a school that we hadn't heard of in Western Connecticut in Newtown. And anytime there's police activity around a school, it is newsworthy, certainly during the school day. So we did, we did it as part of our news break. We are following some breaking news right now out of Newtown. State Police have confirmed there was a shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School on Dickinson Drive in the Sandy Hook section of town. Right now, the entire school district is on lockdown. We have word that a reverse 911 call has gone out to parents of the school, but we don't have specific information about a possible victim in this. A shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown. Keep it right here on NBC Connecticut for the latest information. 
I was in Weathersfield. I just walked out of a place where I got a haircut and I get a call from our assignment editor and he's like, you gotta come to the station right now. I'm like, what's up? And he says, we don't know. He said, I just talked with state police and all they'll tell me is it's bad, it's really bad, get here now. And so, of course, I'm just blowing out the door, driving to the station, I have no idea what I'm getting into. No idea. Someone came running into the room and said, there's a possible shooting at a school. So I was there, I got in the car, um, took my car down, because Newtown is just a town over from where I live, and a photographer came down. And we thought, the initial call that we got, we had thought that we were going to possibly a principal shot, but that was pretty much it. So we didn't really know what was going on. Um, as we were driving down, we kept on seeing a bunch of troopers, and we thought, okay, that you know, this has to be something, but we didn't exactly know the scope of what it was. Later during the day, I received a call from um, an insurance company, the Employee Assistance Program uh, for a local news company, TV news station, and they asked me if I would go in and work with the staff. And at that point, that was my first um, time that I ever realized that news people might need help to deal with this type of uh, a traumatic event. It had never been something that even crossed my mind after 20 years of clinical work. We are now just getting word, this is from the Associated Press, that officials with knowledge of the school shooting, they're saying that 27 people have been killed, 18 of them children. Um, the, the scope of this is um, far beyond what we could possibly have imagined. Um, this is perhaps the worst school tragedy we've seen. Um, and it's happening right now, right here mm -hmm. in the state of Connecticut. Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown was the scene of this shooting about three hours ago, about 9.40 this morning. We've also learned that President Obama has been notified of the situation. We are uh, awaiting word from the White House. Um, also, Governor Malloy is there on scene. He's being briefed, and we expect to hear more from him as well. Again, the Associated Press is now reporting that an official with knowledge of details of the shooting is reporting that there are 27 people dead including 18 children in Newtown. I just remember Sandy. having this, this pit in my stomach and this feeling that I don't remember ever having had before, and I certainly haven't had since. I, I remember just almost saying it like I was saying it to my family. We, we got this sheet of paper, and, and the words on it were almost, it was almost unthinkable. And, if, and frankly, if we hadn't had the build-up to it, if we hadn't realized, see, you know, learned how it was unraveling, it would be the kind of thing that if you were handed the paper that multiple young children inside a school were victim of shooting, even in the world that we're in, even as a snapshot in 2012, late 2012, when there had been so many school shootings already. It had never hit so close to home clearly. It had never hit kids so young in the U.S. You, if you'd been handed that paper and you read it, you would have said, well, 
it can't be true. My photographer is really smart and he notices these officers walking down the street with the big guns and realizes they're gonna kick us out. So he whips the van really quickly into someone's driveway. These people were standing outside their house sort of watching everything going on. Because remember, you've got the helicopters in the air, you've got the guys outside with the canines, you've got officers in military gear on the roof of the school, and the officers come up to us. I don't know if they were from Newtown or they were state or whatnot, because there are officers coming from everywhere, and they just said to us, you guys got to get out of here. And we said, well, we're on private property. And they're like, fine, you got to go inside that house. We don't know what's going on right now. Immediately, you're thinking about self-preservation, because we know that potentially at this point there's an active shooter. We hear some of the neighbors even saying, yeah, we saw somebody in the, in the yard next door running around. We don't know who that was. And so there was a lot of unknown. So immediately when you get out of the van, you're thinking, I don't have a bulletproof vest on. If somebody shoots, I'm done. And my photographer's done. And the people standing next to us could be done. So once we get in the house, we're a little bit better. And we start to get into that whole, OK, it's time to tell the story mode. Now to Len Bestoff, he is a reporter who has actually been in lockdown in a house right next to uh, the school. And Len, tell us what you've been able to see. We have been able to see a lot from here, but we've had to stay in this home where, as you can imagine, the person who woke up in this bedroom today had no idea what was going to be unfolding just to the left of his home here. This is the back side, the southwest side of the school, and you can see that there's still police guarding the gateway area there. And what one of the people who lived in this house told me is that around 9.30 this morning, toward the back end of the school, where she actually went to school, she saw little kindergartners being escorted by about six armed police officers, their guns drawn, both long guns and small guns, trying to bring them to safety. And it's just something that's unimaginable in a town like this. This is a town of a- As is the case in this story, as many other big stories I've covered where it's breaking news and it's violent and it's scary, you transition pretty quickly into the, okay, I'm safe enough and I really have no time to worry about this anymore. I've got to tell the story and keep other people safe and keep them away from this area and try to give some context as to what in the Lord's name is happening here. I think I was reporter mode. I, I knew what I was reporting and I knew the seriousness of it, but I tried not to let it impact me emotionally because I, I felt like if I started getting emotional about it, then I wasn't going to be able to you know, process the information that was coming in and do my job, which is, you know, deliver that information to everyone at home. The hard part was hearing this teenager. So he was, I think, 17 or 18. He was there with his younger sister, I believe. And he had said she was told to cover her eyes and was let out, you know, they were all let out kind of in file, hold on to the person in front of you, close your eyes so that they didn't see the bodies around them. And they could hear different things on the loudspeaker in, you know, like the panic. Um, I, I don't know exactly what they heard, because again, that was all information that was just coming out, um, or not even coming out at that point. But that is what stuck out for me, hearing that a person in first grade kindergarten was led out and kept, had to keep their eyes closed so that they didn't have to see their fellow students. They were, they were telling all the children to hold hands and close their eyes wow. until they were outside. So, I mean, obviously, it was what, they, what was in there must have been very gruesome. And, and my sister said she, that what she saw was uh, just police everywhere, you know, with gu police with guns in every corner. So. Because I've worked a lot with victims, victims of, um, and, and employees who worked in banks when banks were held up, um, stores that were were robbed and dealing with the after effects of that worked a lot in hospitals and emergency departments with um, traumas that the medical staffs have had to deal with loss of children uh, drownings um, gunshots whatever it might be but going into the newsroom 
um, this was completely different because this was dealing with people who were reporting on the news and um, were not victims per se, but had what I would call a vicarious traumatization um, because of their work so closely with the victims. Yeah, the first thing that I found was that I, I, I was impressed with the management of this TV station because they actually recognized that their people might need some support. So they were very um, open to the idea, had me come in, coached me on how to deal with them, and let me know that most of the people probably wouldn't want any help, even though they more than likely were in need of it. So when I went and uh, tried to approach people, um, most of them had very little eye contact with me and just wanted to pay attention to their stories, uh, focusing on their editing, um, their upcoming broadcasts that they might have in place, and really had, um, I would say, some defenses up which probably were there to protect them so that they could continue to go ahead and do the work that they had to do. Every time you do a story of this magnitude, I think a little piece of you dies. And it's a very little piece, and you can keep going and you're going to be able to laugh and smile and have good times, but you realize the longer you do it, and the more these stories become baggage in your psychological world, that there is a limit to how many you can do. When I got to my car, I was done. I, didn't, I actually didn't answer text messages or go on Facebook because as soon as people started saying to me, oh my gosh, I can't believe this, are you okay? I didn't even want to hear that. I had to be in my mode because one, it wasn't about me, and two, I had a job to do. When I was done for the day and I got in my car and I closed the door, I just started crying. And then I went home and I was with my family and they actually just stayed up because they knew I was crying. <laughs> so and that was, that, the crying continued into the next day because um, I was off that day and then came back on Sunday. The biggest component seems to be that the news people um, are unable to unplug from the story. Even when they're able to go home and try to have some distance from um, their work exposure of that day, um, most of them told me that they felt as though they couldn't unplug. In other words, they couldn't shut off the TV or turn off any of the news because they had to stay on top of the story so that they would be well versed when they went back to work the next day. So that made it very difficult for them. There was no break from the story. I had a support system at home and I learned more about, you know, as we talked through it, I think that helps a great deal. I would imagine that it would be more difficult for the reporters that were on scene and were interfacing with the families who were the parents who didn't know at certain moments whether their child was going to walk out of the school. That would be more traumatic, I think, to be there on the ground than it was to be in the studio where, where we were receiving it kind of secondhand. I think that whether they're new going into the field or they've been in the field for a long time, they have to have um, as all people have to have, good coping mechanisms in place. It's sometimes difficult to try to figure out how to cope with something um, if you haven't thought about it prior to the event. So especially for people that are going to be dealing with traumatic events um, as a part of their job on a day-to-day -day basis, be it news people, firefighters, any kind of first responders, um, they ought to have good coping mechanisms in place such as exercise, working out, um, maybe meditation, yoga, uh, a good supportive network of people that they can talk with, maybe other people within their profession that they feel safe and comfortable with where they can talk about these things and being able, be able to vent about them. They ought to avoid um, excessive alcohol or any kind of drug use to numb out their feelings or what we call self-medicate their feelings. Um, because although that may uh, feel effective as they're doing it, it doesn't do anything in the long run for those feelings. They're still there, they'll come back. I bury a lot of stuff, I do. And I'm not saying it's healthy.
but it works for me. And at some point, I may have to deal with it. And that's just what I'm going to have to do. Darren, I have to say that was a fascinating documentary. Thank you. And as a mother and as a former journalist, it is, it's hard for me to watch. I, I think what Len said is very powerful. As far as covering a story, there are certain times where you have to put things in a box and walk away. And is that healthy? Probably not. Have we done it? Absolutely. Have I done it as a journalist? Absolutely. Does it impact your personal life? Absolutely. Yeah, and we've talked about that as, as journalists, even though I tend to do more of the happy stories now because I'm a meteorologist, you still have your earpiece in and you're hearing the stories that are ongoing through the day. And, uh, you know, I think Len said it best is that I didn't deal with it. I will, may have to deal with it someday. Amanda made a comment saying that she went home and uh, she was surrounded by family. And you saw with the quotes that I put on there from the DART Center, and I'll explain a little bit more about what the DART Center is. If you're looking to continue this conversation with your family or if you're a teacher, uh, it's, a, it's a great resource online. But she said that she went home and she was surrounded by her family who gave her a lot of support. Um, there was something the, the, the psychologist, Dr. James Conti, said to me. He said, the, the worst thing you can do is go home and just block it out. And and forget about the day and move on to the next day. And uh, so it's interesting how three different reporters, three different journalists, one in the studio, two that were on scene, felt about and dealt with this type of uh, an issue. Um, we had the Brad Drazen who was in the studio and he has children. So he came, from, he came at it from a different point. So everybody has a little different perspective when they're, when, they're, when they're reacting to this type of a story. Well, I will say as a parent, I thought, I'm so glad I'm no longer a reporter. I had left Fox in 2010 because I would not have been able to cover that. I had a really difficult time as a mom. My daughter goes to school here in West Hartford. She was in first grade. She was the same age as many of those who died. I had a hard enough time, and I have to give kudos to West Hartford schools because they did have a meeting right here at Town Hall to help parents. They had psychologists standing by to help us, and it was so helpful to get us through it. It was right. so traumatic. And, so traumatic. And, and you're thinking about it, and, and you explained it a, a g well earlier. It was an atomic bomb that went off, but it resonated throughout. The particles the were hitting people at different yeah. times. And you've got journalists, and I thought about this, you've got journalists that were right there where right. the bomb went off, you know, per se. And, uh, you know, they were kind of on the front lines of getting the messages out. And then even though people were at home receiving those messages, they were having the same types of exactly. reactions. And, and as a reporter, we had talked about this as well. I've covered stories that have definitely impacted me. Uh, the Cheshire home invasion. That, right. I was frightened. I went to bed at night and I had a knife in my bedroom drawer because I covered that. It, it was just a frightening thing to happen. Mm -hmm. You felt your sense of security was gone. And you had said that's a little bit of post-traumatic stress. There's no yep. doubt. I also, 9-11 was difficult. The lottery shooting in the 90s, right. that was extremely hard on me because I knew three of the people that were killed. I had and just you, interviewed two of them before. And you also even witnessed uh, an execution. I in did. The state. I did. I witnessed the last execution in the state. Michael Ross, uh, I think it was 2004. I was there and I watched him die. And it was the only time in my career as a journalist, 20 years plus, where I was offered grief counseling or tra traumatic shock counseling. Mm -hmm. Management had pulled me in a room and said, you're about to see something, we want to offer you this. And of course, going back to what Len said, I didn't take them up on it because right. I thought, nope, I can get through this. I did my job. I spoke with the National Press Corps minutes after witnessing his execution. You know what I did the next day? I did yard work. I didn't want to go there. Right. I didn't want to think. Right. And that's what, uh, you know, the, the psychologist says. It's best to deal with it. It's best to keep the conversation going. And uh, as you mentioned, you know, West Hartford dealt with it in a way to get their children and get the conversation going. And the reason why I did this project is because 
I think with social media now, getting we're actually at a point now where social media is mostly live, mm -hmm. where live broadcasting is happening on the scene. So you're seeing things unfold as it happens. Yes. So I wanted to get the conversation going and get people talking about this because I think more images are going to be broadcast. I think more images, and, and I'm not here to say that it's right or wrong, but it's going to happen even non-journalists are becoming citizen journalists and they're broadcasting images so you're seeing stuff popping up in your and Facebook i always feeds. say take the social out of it it's media it's media it's media it's media, it's media in real time it. i tell my clients that and I, I see what you're saying it's going to expose us to much more things that will impact our lives in real time more images yeah and and i think we had talked as well too being journalists and now people are seeing this when you cover such horrific events you start to think the anomaly is normal Exactly. And it impacts your life. Just as we were saying, we're like, oh, don't do that. This could happen. My daughter, I'm always like, oh, you're going to hurt yourself. Don't do this. Because we have seen strange scenarios play out. And that's a great way to leave this because I definitely, that was one of the messages I wanted to get across mm -hmm. is that journalists will have a different reality and they have to deal with that. Exactly. And it, this is not just for journalists. If you have, you want to get this conversation going with your, uh, your, 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 students, if you're a teacher or if you're a parent, you want to get this conversation going with your, your children. The DART Center is a basically a focus on journalism and trauma. And there's a great resource, dartcenter.org, which was created by the uh, Columbia School of Journalism. Mm -hmm. And it's a great resource if you want to continue this conversation after this program airs, dartcenter.org. And congratulations, Darren. Thank it you. was a very well thought out and planned documentary. It was a tough story to, uh, to put together, um, but I think more positives, if we can get more positives out of that tragedy somehow, get a conversation going, that was the, that was the, uh, the goal. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.